You are welcome to this brief preview of the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 9 through 20. Reading from the Legacy Standard Bible of 2020, with 5th century or earlier manuscript variants noted in green color. If you teach or lead a Bible discussion, consider these learning objectives. First, by the end of this lesson, participants will know and rejoice in their privileges as the redeemed. Secondly, participants will learn to conduct themselves in a manner pleasing to the Lord. And thirdly, participants will worship Jesus Christ, who is superior to all created beings. We're following the semantic structure proposed by John Callow. Focusing on these passages. In our discussion, we shall follow this outline. My co-workers and I write to strengthen you. We thank and pray to God for you. We thank God for you and we pray to God for you. Because Christ ranks above all created beings. God has brought us into Christ's kingdom and God has made peace with us. He did so when he redeemed us. In a group, have someone read aloud the verse. If you are studying alone, stop the video, read the verse in this version or any other version that you prefer. Give others an opportunity to make their observations and to pose any questions they have. Then you may do the same. You may wish to ask, For what reason did Paul pray? Is the reason the preceding text in verse 1-4? Or is it the following text introduced by the conjunction that? Note that the term spiritual can simply refer to spiritual matters or insights given or revealed by the Holy Spirit. Note that wisdom is taking action that pleases God. And understanding is to know how God works in the world. As an example of someone who did not cease to pray, Samuel said, As for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you, and I will teach you the way that is good and right. Read verse 10. Note that worthy can mean appropriate to or belonging to, or it can mean deserving of some reward. Which is it in this context? Good works for the Apostle Paul meant things that are excellent and profitable for people. To know God at one level means to perceive his will, and secondly, to experience his actions. You might ask, or raise for discussion, what kinds of behavior please God most? This concept is illustrated from the apocryphal book Wisdom of Solomon. Their hope is full of immortality, and having been disciplined a little, they will be greatly benefited because God tested them and found them worthy of himself. And in Second Maccabees, Maccabios called upon the Lord who works wonders because he knew that it is not by arms, but as it seems good to God that he procures victory for those who are worthy. Walking worthily of God has great reward. Next, read verses 11 and 12. After others have commented, pose this query. What does God's powerful might enable us to do, according to these verses? Find answers in the verse. And then ask, how can we tap into that power, according to these verses? Think of giving thanks. And thirdly, who are these saints? This term comes from the First Testament, wherein saints 
are those spiritual beings who dwell with God in the heavens. At the term light and dark was used in Hebrew scriptures and in Second Temple period literature to refer to the righteous place where God dwells. What benefits and privileges are ours according to Colossians 1, 9 through 12? Let each participant mention one thing until they can find no more. They may consult the list that they made during their home study or by scanning the verses in their Bible. Read verses 13 and 14. Notice that in verse 14, from about the 13th century, some Greek manuscripts added the phrase, through his blood, after the term redemption, borrowed from Ephesians 1, 7. Pose this query, what or where is darkness? In the First Testament, everything outside of the camp, that is, in the wilderness, was considered to be a dark place where demons and evil spirits dwelt. What kept us under the rulers of darkness? Think about their deceit, their power, and our own sinfulness. And how does redemption solve that issue? Well, Jesus has forgiven us our sins. We are no longer subject to evil spirits, and we are acceptable to God. How else could we translate the phrase, Son of his love? Perhaps in English we could say, The Son whom he loves. And then ask, what is the distinction between the kingdom of the Son and the kingdom of God? Many will not be able to reply. If any do, thank them for their insight. And then show the following slide. We note that the kingdom of God, in one sense, has always existed as an everlasting kingdom. However, when Jesus came... He preached the gospel of the kingdom of God, saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel, the good news. According to Colossians 1.13, we are now in the kingdom of the Son, that is, the Son of God. And this will continue, along with the power of darkness, until the end comes when the Son will deliver the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all evil rule and all spiritual authority and power. For group discussion, ask what are Jesus' titles, privileges, and accomplishments according to our passage? Let each one mention one thing till they can find no more. They may consult a list they made during their home study, or they can scan verses while they speak. Read verse 15. It is still the Son of God, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Note that the Greek word for image is icon. This conveys the meaning that God has been made visible. In the First Testament, God sometimes appeared in human form, whereas in the New Testament, he was born as a human being and dwelt in our midst. The term firstborn, prototokos, can mean birth order, but in scripture it refers to the status of a firstborn, or rather to the preeminence of the creator himself. Notice this term is used in Colossians of firstborn or the preeminent one over creation, in the book of Hebrews over the world, in Romans 8 over believers, and in Revelation 2.8 as a variant reading. But note here, how does the first half of the verse and the second half explain each other? Well, the firstborn of creation is the one who came as the image of the invisible God. The term firstborn was used in scripture of King David. Psalm 89.17 reads, 
and I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Well, David was not the first king ever to be born, but he is the one who ranks over all others. The Septuagint reads similarly, I will make him a firstborn, high amongst the kings of the earth. This translates the Hebrew term bakor, which meant a firstborn or oldest offspring of either animals or humans, but was also used of the firstborn of Yahweh, which was in one text Israel, in another Ephraim, then of King David, and even once of a plague. Of course, the Septuagint translated this as prototokos, and the New Testament has borrowed its Greek term from the Septuagint. Read verse 16. You might ask, In him all things were created, all what things? Well, in this context, it seems to refer to all of creation, everything visible and invisible, including living beings, spiritual and human. Therefore, is the Son a created being? Or is he a co-creator? Or is he the creator? Answer from the scripture. And in what two realms are found these rulers or authorities? Well, in the visible realm, it would refer to human rulers. In the invisible realm, to spirit beings who are to be displaced by us. So who is it who currently rule over our national and international leaders? From whence do they get their evil designs? Why do they go at war against each other? Why do they use the power of the state to support wickedness and to repress the righteous? Well, they are being ruled by spiritual beings. Read verse 17. The sun is before all things, and in the sun all things hold together. The term before translates the Greek preposition pro. This means before, but is it before in time, or before in space, or before in status, or before in order, or rank, or strength, or in all of these? The term all things, tapanta, is a neuter plural, literally the alls. Which all things? Well, those already referenced. They hold together. This is an intransitive verb, meaning it takes no object, and therefore means to come to be in a condition of coherence, to continue, to endure, to exist, to hold together. It is the Son of God that holds all things together. Read aloud verse 18. Why the switch here from all things to the church? He was the firstborn of creation. Now he's called the firstborn of the dead, who is head of the body, that is, the church. Well, Christ is preeminent not only throughout the creation, but he is the preeminent one in the church. It is he alone who is our mediator with God. The problem in Colossae was that the Christians had been deceived, probably by Jewish philosophers, who interposed between God and man with other layers of spiritual beings. More about that in another lesson. He is the beginning. This translates the Greek term arche, which can mean beginning or one who starts things, even for the first cause of all creation. Physically, it can mean a corner or fifthly, the basis of something, a structure or an idea, but more pertinent to our context, an authority figure, one who holds an office or rules over a domain. Again, the term firstborn, here translated from the dead. Two very early or ancient manuscripts said, firstborn of the dead, meaning preeminent over death. 
Read verses 19 and 20. Note that the term fullness, which means sum total, fullness, or even superabundance, full measure of deity in this case. That is, the fullness is God himself dwelling in his creation. God has reconciled us to himself. That is, God has already solved the human sin problem from his side by Jesus' crucifixion. Now it is to us to proclaim to our fellow human beings, be reconciled with God. It is important to note that every idea in the book of Colossians proves to be pre-Gnostic, that is, before Gnosticism became a fully developed philosophical system. For the idea of filling already existed in the First Testament in other First Temple Jewish and pagan literature. Thus, it was Paul who wrote this epistle in the first century, not a second or third century pseudepigrapher, as some 19th century scholars surmised, or as 20th century liberals taught, and as the 21st century Wikipedia asserts. Note, for examples, that the idea of fullness exists not only in Colossians, but also in Psalm 24.1, look it up, or in Jeremiah 23.24, go read it. The Roman poet Seneca wrote, God himself fills all his work. The Greek Aristides wrote, Zeus has filled the all. The Jewish Philo wrote that God fills all things. The Apocrypha book Wisdom of Solomon wrote, The Spirit of the Lord has filled the world. And the Jewish book of Enoch, In him dwells the Spirit of Wisdom, for he is the elect one before the Lord. To conclude your study session, give others an opportunity to reply to what is one truth, insight, belief, or action that you learned from this passage this week. For our next study session, let us read a chapter of the book of Colossians each day in versions that we trust. Then find in Colossians 1, 21 through 29, all that God requires for human beings to be saved forever, that is, to enjoy everlasting life.